Today's video is brought to you by Stamps.com. Go to Stamps.com slash Kendall Ray to get a four-week trial, free postage, and a digital scale. Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. So happy to have you here for another video. If you are new, then welcome. So today I'm going to be telling you a crazy story. Oh man. And this one is about a man named John Darwin. Let's just dive into this one. Okay. So John was born on August 14th, 1950 in Durham, which is a county in Northeast England. John lived there most of his life. And in his early adult years, he actually was a math and science teacher. After that, he went off to work at a bank. And then lastly, he got a job as a prison guard at the HMP Holmes House Prison. In 1973, he met his soon-to-be wife, Anne Stephenston. Two years after they met, they married and they had two kids named Mark and Anthony. So Anne was born on March 7th, 1952. And there's pretty limited information about her. It's believed that she was born and raised in Northeast England as well. And while she was married to John, Anne worked for many years as a receptionist at a physician's office. So in addition to their, you know, individual jobs, they also wanted to become rich in real estate. Now, many people do become millionaires, billionaires through real estate. However, it can be really hard to do. If it's done right, it's very successful. But you know, if it's done wrong, it goes horribly wrong. And John was one of those people who definitely measured his success and other people's success by wealth. So it wasn't very surprising that he had an interest in real estate and dreamed of making it big. So by the time that John and Anne actually were ready to start investing, they were looking at places in Northeast England and their sons at this point were grown adults living out of the house. And they really went in on the real estate thing. They actually bought 12 different properties all around Seton Carew. And obviously they're going to rent these properties out and hopefully profit from them. And several of the properties that they owned actually were right next to each other. But unfortunately, all of this didn't go so well for John and Anne. They quickly began losing money and racked up about 700 pounds in debt. And that's mainly because the rent that they were charging wasn't enough to cover their mortgage, which I feel like it's pretty standard to know that rent you charge should at least, at the very least, you know, cover your mortgage. But that obviously wasn't the case with the Darwins. And by the early 2000s, they were nearing bankruptcy. And in mid-March of 2002, John and Anne were denied a 20,000 pound loan. And it became clear that they were going to need to declare bankruptcy at that point. But that's when John came up with a plan to free them from all their troubles. Rather than you know, face the consequence of their own actions, John decided that it would be a good idea to fake his own death. Perfect plan, right? This would allow Anne, his wife, to collect on his life insurance policy and pensions, and then they could pay off their debt. Not only that, but there would be money left over for them to live comfortably. Some people believe that Anne was on board with this plan from the beginning, making her equally culpable in the crime, although she and many supporters believe that she was bullied into this plan by John and felt obligated to go along with it. But either way, it's undeniable that she was in some way complicit in this scam. So it all began on March 21st, 2002. John decided it would be a good idea for him to disappear from a canoe. Very interesting thought process here, but he decides he's going to paddle out in his canoe into the sea and disappear. But in reality, he would just paddle back to shore and stage his disappearance. Hope no one saw him come out of the water. Now, obviously you want to do this on a day with pretty bad weather. That's really going to sell the story. That day wasn't that bad, wasn't too stormy. The waves were a little choppy, but he felt like it was believable enough that he got into some type of accident that cost him his life. And actually a neighbor of theirs saw him paddling out and he remembered thinking that it wasn't the best weather to be taking your canoe out into the water. I mean, it really didn't make sense to him, but he was like, you know, whatever. He's a grown adult and he went about his day. So before paddling out to sea, John calls Anne and she's at work. There were actually four calls in total where he told her exactly what the plan is and what her part of the plan would be. He told her where to pick him up, where she would take him and what she would do after. And then after their calls, then he hangs up with her. He gets his canoe and he starts paddling out to sea and goes just about as far as, you know, where the naked eye couldn't see him from the shore. Then he makes a sharp right turn and he makes his way to the North Gare Beach, which is in Seton Carew. 
and that's where Anne was instructed to pick him up at approximately seven o'clock. When he got to their car in the North Gare parking lot, he was wearing black jeans, a black jacket, and a black hat, and he also had a sack with all the things that he needed to make his disappearance. Anne then drives him approximately 40 minutes away to the Durham Railway Station, and his plan was to spend about a month in the Lake District on the northwest side of England. And before he takes off, he tells Anne that next she is to call the prison and act like everything is normal and ask to speak to him. Obviously, this is going to draw up suspicion that he never came to work that day. And then at 9.30 p.m. that night, March 21st, Anne calls up 911 and tells them that her 51-year-old husband, John Darwin, is missing. So a massive search begins very shortly after this, 1 a.m. on March 22nd. They really wasted no time before they went out and started looking for John. Five boats from the Royal National Lifeboat Institution, two Coast Guard teams, a police aircraft, and a team of police officers scoured the sea for any sign of John and his canoe. It went on for four days, and the search teams actually covered 200 square miles of sea. Well, it certainly was a massive search. We were called at 1 a.m. on the 22nd of March to search for a person that had been reported missing from Hartlepool in a canoe, and it involved six RNLI lifeboats, an RAF seeking helicopter, an RAF Nimrod aircraft, the police aircraft, and numerous shore parties searching the full length of the coast all the way from Seaton Carew down to Saltburn. And it cost the government over 100,000 pounds to conduct this search. And all they ended up finding was a paddle. The rescue services threw all their resources into the hunt for him. Look North reporter Peter Lugg was at the scene. This has been one of the most extensive searches for many years. Why is that so? Well, just think about it. One canoeist out there in the open sea, no navigational aids, no homing beacon, no radio equipment, not like a, a modern trawler might have. It's been literally like trying to find a drop in the ocean. It wasn't until March 7th, 2002, that the canoe washed up on the shore. And once the canoe was found, everyone figured John had passed away. So in the weeks after his mystery disappearance, John is waiting for Anne to call him and tell him that the coast is clear for him to come back. And during all this time, they're actually frequently speaking to each other. And as wild as it sounds, this guy actually came back to the town he disappeared from. Even though he was still considered a missing and likely deceased person, he wanted to go right back to Seton Carew. So eventually Anne heads out to pick him up and bring him back. And she drives about two and a half hours from Seton Carew to Whitehaven. And she said that when she picked him up, she hardly recognized him because he grew out a huge beard. He had a walking stick and was walking with a limp, all part of his disguise, of course. And what's crazy is he ended up moving back into that townhouse, townhouse house number three, where he was last living. But since, like I said, a lot of the houses they owned were right next to each other, he built a secret passage from house number three to house number four. This way, if their sons or other family and friends came to their house, he could slip away into the other unit, which they also owned. And Anne said that their gravel driveway made it easy to hear if someone was approaching. And obviously, John had to spend a lot of time indoors during this whole period while he was waiting to reemerge back into the public. He had to lay low for a little while, so he had to stay inside, but luckily he did have the views of the ocean to look at, so that's kind of nice. But it wasn't going to work forever, so clearly he needed to construct a new identity so he could venture outside once again. So John starts hanging out in graveyards, checking out all the possible identities, looking at the obituary section of the newspaper. And obviously this is him trying to be nice. He is trying to keep anyone that's currently alive from having to get involved in this scam. So instead he's stealing the identity of a dead person. And he felt good about that. So after weeks of searching, John finds a new name and the new name is John. I'm not kidding. He wanted to steal the identity of five week old deceased baby, John Jones. And he thought it was perfect. It was gonna make this easy, you know, John, John. Not only that, they had the same birthday, which made it easy for him to remember. Also the reason he said that he wanted to still have the name John was in case someone recognized him out in public and said, hey, John, if he turned around by accident, you know, he didn't want it to be suspicious that he was John Darwin. So he just wanted to be John Jones. So John Darwin was able to get a copy of John Jones birth certificate. And from there, he was all set with his new identity. I wanted a birth certificate of someone who wasn't alive because I didn't want to ruin somebody else's life. 
And then he just started going outside again in the town he disappeared from. And once he got comfortable with going back outside, he spent most of his time at the beach and at the library. He ends up getting a library card with his new identity and then uses the library card to get a passport. And John clearly felt very confident that he wouldn't get caught because he ended up using his real home address where he lived with Anne on his passport. So then in April 2003, a year or so after he disappears, he is declared dead officially. And what's sad is another family member actually had to break the news to her sons who had no idea that the whole time their father was not only alive, but still living at home with their mother who is also lying. So the police and financial institutions decided that there was enough evidence to support John's death. And so Anne was able to use his death certificate to access his 25,000 pound life insurance policy. She was also able to access his 25,000 pound teacher's pension and his 58,000 pound prison service pension, a 4,000 pound payment from the Department of Work and Pensions and another 137,000 pounds from a Norwich Union mortgage insurance policy. In the beginning, Anne collected 249 thousand pounds, all of which was based on a lie that her husband was dead. So at this point, many of their debts were paid off or forgiven, which allowed them to breathe a little easier. And John just keeps living his life, you know, leaving the house pretty frequently, trying to stay under wraps, but eventually someone's going to see him, right? He was actually recognized by a former colleague of his, but he was lucky because this colleague knew that John was dead and he ends up calling Anne and lets her know that he thinks he saw like a cousin of John's or something because they looked so similar, but it was John. Then there was another alleged spotting of John in 2003. It was one of their tenants who recognized him and actually asked him, <laughs> said to him, aren't you supposed to be dead? And he said, please don't tell anyone. So these close calls made John start to feel like maybe he needed to get out of town, probably wise. <laughs> During his time indoors, John got very involved in an online fantasy life game called Asheron's Call. He would sometimes play the game all day, but he ends up meeting a woman through this game and her name was Kelly Steele. Kelly was a married mother living in Kansas City. And although they never developed a romantic relationship, they did develop a friendship that led to a business proposal. John told Kelly that he would send her money to buy a ranching property in Kansas. She would be responsible for building an equestrian center and John would act as an angel investor. Once the ranch was up and running, he would receive a portion of the profits, but she would be able to run it at her discretion. So Kelly ends up finding a property and she ends up buying it for $26,500. And then using his passport, John flew to America and he met Kelly for the first time and they began to work on the business plan. But things didn't go smoothly in Kansas, friends. Kelly said that John's behavior started to become extremely concerning, so much so to the point that she didn't even want him to stay at her house where her kids were. After kicking him out, John went to stay at a nearby hotel. And it wasn't long after that, just about two and a half weeks later, Kelly actually wanted to be done with John and this whole business idea altogether. But after she asks him to leave, she starts getting death threats from John. He said he needed his investment money back from her ASAP or else. And he said that he knew people in the mob who he could send after her and her children. And she was unable to sell the property to get his money back. And so she lived in fear of John for a long time. Luckily for her though, John went back to Seton Carew and he was actually looking for a new place for him and Anne to live. In 2004, John and Anne visited Cyprus to look for land to buy, but they ultimately decided that this wasn't gonna be the place they were going to live and they went back to the drawing board. And in 2005, John took a trip to Spain after getting in contact with a catamaran boat dealer named Robert Hopkin. John seemed interested in buying a catamaran large enough for the couple to live in full time. And Robert had a boat that seemed like it was perfect for what John and Anne were looking for. It cost about 60,000 pounds, but still had some work that needed to be done on it. And of course, John was able to negotiate the boat down to half of what they wanted for it. So 30,000 pounds instead. But he told Robert that he wouldn't purchase the boat until all the repairs were fully made. And apparently John started to get really rude at this point and he was demanding a lot from them. So they decided that the deal was off. Robert, he just, 
decided he didn't even want to sell in the boat anymore. So John and Anne ended up going back to the drawing board again, and they closed out 2005 with a new plan in mind. They were going to move to Panama. They figured that this would be a great place to hide away from anyone that might be looking for John. So the couple flew out to Panama in July of 2006 and began looking at properties. They ended up meeting a real estate agent who showed them several properties, and they settled on a place about two hours away from the capital. John and Anne paid about 200,000 pounds for the land and loved the greenery and nature of the area, so they planned to build a house on it. They also planned to establish some sort of business that they could operate right on the land that they now owned. And once they settled in on this plan, they sold their home in Seton Carew, and Anne said goodbye to her sons, who seemed happy their mom was living out her dream. And then John transferred all their money into the Panama banking system in various accounts. So it seemed like this final stage of their plan might actually work. It's a little more private. <laughs> but unfortunately, John and Anne made a big, big old mistake. In addition to the land that they just bought, also got an apartment and they met with the director of this program called Move to Panama, and they allowed him to take a picture of them, and they had it posted to their website. So back to that in a bit. But several months after living in Panama, John decided to get back on a plane and returned to England. At first he said the reason he did it was because he missed his sons, but eventually he said he returned because he wanted to pay off his debts, which he says was his plan all along. Either way, he was back and he hatched yet another plan to get away with the original scam. And at 5.30 p.m. on December 1st, 2007, John walked into the West End Central Police Station and said, I think I'm a missing person. That's when John claimed to have no memory. That's right. John is going to go with the whole no memory of any of this. And he went bold with it. He said that he didn't remember anything since 2002, which is actually two years before he went missing. First tonight, the extraordinary story of the man who's turned up safe and well after being missing, presumed dead for more than five years. It was feared that John Darwin was lost at sea when the remains of his canoe were washed up on a beach near Hartlepool in 2002. But incredibly, on Saturday evening, Mr Darwin walked into a London police station and told officers, I think I'm a missing person. Well, tonight, no one seems any nearer to solving the mystery of where he's been or what he's been doing for the last five years. Mary Askew joins us now from Redcar. What can you tell us about the latest, Mary? Well, Lara, we're in... Redka tonight because this is where much of the manpower came from for the search, the massive search that was launched when John Darwin went missing. It's a night that the former prison officer from Stockton Jail says he can't remember anything of. In fact, he says he can't remember anything of the last five and a half years as I've been finding out. Obviously, police immediately questioned him and really didn't believe his story from the jump. And so when they interviewed him, it didn't take long for him to crack and reveal the scam that he and Anne had been running the last five years. And, and what did you do? Well, I took the canoe out and paddled out to sea. And So you did actually physically paddle out to sea? Yes. And where did you paddle to? South. North. I, I, I can't remember what you call it. North Gear or something like that. Okay then, so you pulled in at the pier and did what? Did you have a car waiting? Or...? I had made my wife, or basically told her that, you know, if we were doing things then she had to agree and she picked me up. Did she? From the pier? And what did you do with the canoe? Just let it push it back out to sea or? No, I just pushed it out to sea. So word got out right away that John was still alive and the media caught wind of it and wanted desperately to talk to Anne and John, obviously, but definitely Anne. They wanted to know if she knew her husband was alive that whole time. Was she in on it? Everyone was curious. And a reporter named David Lee was the lucky person to break the story. And he said he got a call at 5 a.m. that early December when someone told him that a guy allegedly came back from the dead. David learned that Anne was living in Panama and he was the first person to get on a plane and go try to interview her. He didn't have a lot of information about what her situation was like in Panama, but he was able to find her apartment and unit number. David went and knocked on the door, got no answer, waited a little while, and eventually came to the conclusion that she either was not living there or wasn't there at the time. But just as he was going to leave, he heard a voice on the other side of the door, and it was Anne, and she asked him what he wanted. And that's when David told her that her husband was found still alive. 
jigs up. So Anne invites him in and tries to act pleasantly surprised to hear that her husband is not dead. He is alive. He's back in England. And at first, David kind of believed her that she really was surprised to learn of this. He did say, though, that she had very anxious energy. But while he's meeting with her, David got a call that changed everything. Someone found that photograph of John and Anne online where he was clearly happy, healthy and not suffering from amnesia. The photo was sent to David, who happens to still be with Anne. He shows it to her and he said that she just went pale. For a while she didn't speak, but then eventually she said, the boys are never going to believe me. And once she started talking, she didn't stop and she told David everything. They spoke for hours about the scam that she and John had been running. And she did try to lie to David about some of the details at first. She tried to say that she truly believed John was dead until he showed up at her doorstep a year later, but he quickly discovered that that was false. It was clear that she had been involved since day one. Anne did tell David that she didn't think they would be able to get away with this forever. And it was something that she really didn't want to do. She felt pressured by John. She didn't think it was a good idea. He pushed her anyway. So David ends up convincing Anne to fly back to the UK. And on December 9th, 2007, she was arrested at the Manchester airport. And just five days before that, John had been officially arrested on suspicion of fraud and charged with obtaining money by deception and using a false identity to obtain a passport. And when Anne was in custody, she spilled the story right away. I knew the day that John had gone missing that he had gone missing uh, and that he planned it. I got a telephone call from him at work on that afternoon to say that he was going to go out in the canoe and he wanted me to get home by seven o'clock that evening to pick him up and to help him make his getaway. Um, he'd asked me to pick him up uh, um, in the car park at North Gare and he wanted me to pick him up about seven. I think I got there by seven, I'm not sure. He wasn't actually there, I had to sit and wait a while. Eventually, he came towards the car and he said he had everything with him that he needed. It turns out, over the years, the couple had stolen 649,000 pounds. The investigation into their scam did conclude that neither Mark or Anthony were aware of what their parents had done and were equally deceived as everyone else was. So to help secure the case against the Darwins, the police ended up using information that was technically obtained illegally, but they eventually found it to be legally viable in their case. A news correspondent named Gerard Tub actually hacked into John's email and found proof of the crimes that he had committed, which included money laundering, using a passport with a false identity, and more. And again, this was obtained illegally, so it wouldn't have been something they would have been able to use in court, but police said that the information was collected in the public interest, and therefore Gerard wouldn't get in trouble and the emails could be used. And Gerard actually made an entire database that police could use during their case. So then on March 13th, 2008, John pled guilty to seven charges of obtaining cash by deception and one charge of a passport offense. And because he pled guilty, John would not go to trial and he was sentenced to six years and three months in prison. Anne, on the other hand, decided to take her case to court and fight against the six charges of deception and nine charges of using criminal property that she was facing. I'm very sorry for all the problems I've caused. It was always my intention to pay back the money. That's what John Darwin, the back from the dead canoeist, told the police after they charged him with a string of fraud offences totaling nearly a quarter of a million pounds. Today at Leeds Crown Court he admitted obtaining money from life insurance and pension policies by deception. But his wife, Anne Darwin, denied all the charges she faces. But the evidence against her was way too strong and even her sons ended up testifying against her. So on July 23rd, 2008, Anne was convicted at the Teesside Crown Courthouse and sentenced to six years, six months in prison. And in the end, all of their assets were seized, even their apartment and land that they owned in Panama. And they ended up finding money in six different bank accounts. And I guess Anne tried to repair her relationship with her sons for years. I don't know. After you lie to your child about their father being dead for years? I don't know how you walk that one back. That's pretty tough. Anne obviously was heartbroken about this and suffered from severe depression, but luckily, eventually her children came around and decided to forgive her. And of course, that was great for her. However, they never 
forgave John. I mean, that was just too much. John and Anne were both released from prison in 2011, John on January 18th and Anne on March 9th. So there is a bit of a happy ending here for Anne. She, you know, was able to repair things with her sons and she decided to leave John, which was great for her. And then not even a year after he was released from prison, John was arrested once again, this time at the Newcastle airport after he came back to the UK from Ukraine. Given his criminal history, he was not authorized to take this trip but he did anyway, because John does what he wants. He went to Ukraine to meet with a woman named Anna, who is a mail order bride. When it came to all the money that they stole, all of their debt, they were ordered to pay it back, but it seems like Anne was the only one who actually kept up with the payments on that. And by 2014, she had actually paid off about 500,000 pounds of what she owed. But John, on the other hand, only paid back 122 pounds out of the 687,000 pounds that he owed. In 2015, John, who is 70 years old at this time, remarried a 47-year-old woman named Mercy May. Mercy is a mother and runs a retail business in the Philippines, and the two of them live together. Anne, on the other hand, lives in York in the UK and seems to be living a pretty quiet, low-key life. And a hotel back in Seton Carew actually profited for a few years off the Darwin story and advertised a Darwin room for guests to stay. However, that hotel was bought out by new ownership and they no longer... <laughs> do this Darwin room thing because they feel like it's pretty disrespectful to profit off of this crime. And this story has since been written into a book titled The Thief, His Wife and the Canoe by David Lee, who was the man who broke the story. And it has also been adapted into a short series on ITV and it has the same name. Of course, the show does exaggerate on some of the details of the story, but for the most part, it follows the true storyline. And Anne also wrote a book about the experience called Out of My Debt. So that is the John Darwin story, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you found that to be interesting. So we all know the holiday season is sneaking up on us. And if you didn't know, I'm also a small business owner. And if you are also a small business owner, you know that the holiday season can be the most insane time for shipping. But luckily, stamps.com has everything that I need and you need to make your life a whole lot easier if you are also a small business owner. It's the 24-7 post office that you can access from anywhere. And there are no no lines, no traffic, and no hassle. For more than 20 years, Stamps.com has been indispensable for over 1 million businesses. You can get access to UPS and USPS shipping rates right from your computer. You can use Stamps.com to print postage wherever you do business, and all you need is a computer and a printer. And if you need a package pickup, you can easily schedule it through your Stamps.com dashboard. And with Stamps.com switch and save feature, you can easily compare carriers and rates so you know you're getting the best deal every time. So get ahead of the holiday chaos this year and get started with stamps.com today. You can sign up at stamps.com slash Kendall Ray for a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus free postage and a free digital scale. There are no long-term commitments or contracts. Just go to stamps.com slash Kendall Ray. Thank you to stamps.com for sponsoring this video. I will be back next week with another one, but until then stay safe out there. 